Don't be anxious about anything. Anxiety may be the most common emotion right now, as I try to think of all the, the negative emotions and positive emotions we might have. Anxiety might be the most common. And Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, anything. Here we are in a COVID crisis, a pandemic. We have children that are in school, or we have children that are out of school, and in both cases there's some anxiety. I have one grandson who doesn't do well out of school, I have another who does well in school, and so on. I have a son who's a medical doctor, he's in hospitals, he has patients that he sees every day. I have grandchildren in college, not having a normal year, in one case for last year. Don't be anxious about anything. Politics, ads on TV, political ads, they don't make you anxious. But there is a lot at stake, and many of us are anxious about it. We'll be anxious, maybe to the end of November, who knows. Don't be anxious about our country, the divisions, maybe more serious than any other time since the Civil War. Don't be anxious about anything, about the Church of Jesus Christ, divided, sometimes over basic morals, the loss of our witness, particularly to youth. Don't be anxious about anything at all. Again, I'll mention that Paul knew what he was talking about, of course. Don't worry about anything. Is that really possible? First thing he says is pray. That's not a comment. Prayer is trusting. Prayer is our trusting. First of all, I think in God's sovereignty, that God is in control. We put our trust in the sovereignty of God, first of all, when we pray. I read something some years ago that happened uh, just before 9-11 in 2001. It was in the midst of an Israeli-Arab conflict at the time. And there was a motorcade carrying the security service chief of, of Gaza. He came under bullet fire from Israeli troops. And uh, there was supposed to be a, a peace. The frightened security official called Yasser Arafat, you may remember him, from his car for help. Arafat called the U.S. ambassador. The U.S. ambassador called the Secretary of State, Colin Powell. Colin Powell phoned Ariel Sharon, who was Israel's prime minister at the time, and Israel's prime minister ordered the shooting to stop, and it did. The security chief had connections. Eventually got to where it needed to go. You and I have connections. Pray. Pray to the one who is sovereign, who really is in control. Pray to the one whom we can trust because he loves us. It's really startling what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. Don't, don't even worry about the basics much less the luxuries that we have. Pray to God who is sovereign, but pray to God who loves you. That's maybe more important. I love the way J.D. Phillips translates Romans 8.32. God who did not grudge his own son, but gave him up for us all, can we not trust such a God to give us with him everything else we can need? First step to being worry free is to pray, to talk to our sovereign God, our living God, who are about everything. Paul uses prayer and supplication here. He's using two words prayer and requests, petitions and requests. He uses two words for emphasis do this, pray. 
and their Muslims pray five times a day. The story is told that when when Muhammad went up to heaven, he was given instructions to pray 55 times a day, and he argued God down to five. And as he was leaving heaven, he met Moses, and Moses says, why did you let him stop at five? For a, Mo for a Muslim to pray five times a day, they're ritual prayers. You understand that? We're told to pray unceasing, to make prayer ceaseless. That means to be in touch, aware of God, in everything. Of course, I had to preach to myself, you know, while I'm preaching this sermon or preparing it. Uh, our, our refrigerator is old, but it's it's a great one. In fact, the last time we had somebody come for repairs, they said, don't get rid of this, keep it. You won't find another like it. But it makes funny noises. And I was getting a little worried, you know. I mean, this, this these days, you don't want to replace anything. You want to kind of make it through. So I decided, well, Jim, you're preaching about praying about things. You better even pray about the refrigerator. Pray about everything, Paul says. With thanksgiving. You know, that's something we easily forget. We're always asking, asking, asking. But with thanksgiving, Paul says. Pray with thanksgiving. Remember all the good stuff that's going on. And all the good relationships and all the wonderful things we have all the blessings of life. Of course, it reminded me of that hymn that we sometimes sing, Count Your Blessings. When upon life's billows you're tempted, tossed, when you're discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, mainly one by one, and it will surprise you that the Lord has done. And by the way, the passage begins with the command to rejoice. It's a command, rejoice. Determined to be thankful. Take yourself in hand and say, I, I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to begin with thanksgiving. You can rejoice in the Lord in His love and His power and His control. The second thing is to have peace through right thinking, prayer, and thinking. Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's true is truthful in every aspect of life. The evil one is the, the father of lies. And we hear lies all the time. But we have to think on truth. Whatever is honorable. That's something that has gravity, something that matters, not the frivolous things, the cheap things. Whatever is just, whatever is right, in other words. Whatever is pure, not vulgar, not something that damages others. Whatever is pleasing, pure. Likely to win folks, not damage them. Whatever's commendable. Whatever calls forth a well done from somebody if they, if they ever could read your thoughts. Whatever's praiseworthy, excellent. Whatever's really good. Now, we can't control the, the thoughts that pass through our minds, but we certainly can control what we dwell on. And I think that's Paul's point. So I like the way the message puts that. Fill your minds and meditate on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Of course, it's God's Spirit that deals with us in our thinking. That's what Paul says in Romans 12, too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll know what God wants you to do. You'll know how good and pleasing and perfect His will is. When we know God's Word, when we're thinking God's thoughts, it affects how we live, what we do. And of course, that's Paul's third point. Peace to right actions. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen and did. Do those things you've seen in me. Sounds kind of proud. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me. But then he adds, as I am of Christ. Of course, that's his point. Don't just imitate me because of who I am, but when I am following Christ. Um, 
I thought about that as being arrogant, and I thought, could I honestly say that to my kids, to my grandkids, to my friends, to my neighbors? I, I should be able to. Watch me, watch my life, watch my thinking, watch what I'm saying, watch what I'm doing. Imitate me because I'm imitating Jesus Christ. I should be able to say that. Of course, the point that Paul is making here is do God's will. Pray, yes, take my thoughts, and then do God's will. There's no peace, there's no contentment apart from doing God's will. Isaiah has some beautiful verses. And one of them, in chapter 27, is the effect of righteousness will be peace, he says. Right, the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. And then he has a contrast in chapter 48. There is no peace, says the Lord. For the wicked. Peace comes. Real peace comes when we're doing God's will. And that sometimes means stepping out. You know, you know what you should do, and it's uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it. And comes not only a peace, but a fulfillment, which I guess is part of it, a contentment. The active implication to knowing. God's peace and the God of peace is to do peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. For they'll be called the children of God. They'll be like God. You probably know that, that great prayer of Francis Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there's hatred, let me so love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, Faith, where there's despair, hope, where there's darkness, light, where there's sadness, joy. Oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Peace requires prayer, talking to God, right thinking, right action. Paul promises that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace counteracts the effects of all that's going on around us that produces anxiety. And of course, that's not just Paul saying that. That's God saying it. That's Jesus' promise one of his last promises he made to his disciples before he went to the cross. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as this world gives, you're not going to find it. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. Jesus came to give us peace. You remember what the angels said at his birth? Peace on earth among those with whom God is well pleased. Those who are in his will. Peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guard like a, like a soldier guard. Hearts, and minds, your emotions, your, your total being, your affections. In union with Christ Jesus is part of our relationship with Him. Peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will be with you. The very God Himself who is called the God of peace. I mentioned earlier, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The God of Peace will be with you. A supernatural peace. Because it's part of the gift of the Holy Spirit from within. Without, above, around us. The peace of God. The God of Peace. There's an old hymn that I, I used to love to sing. I, I, I don't, it's not in our hymn books. I don't I don't know about the brown, I didn't check the brown one, but it's peace, perfect peace. And it kind of sums up what Paul's saying here in Philippians. Peace, perfect peace in this dark world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace to an end. Peace, perfect peace by thronging duties pressed to do the will of Jesus. This is rest. Peace, perfect peace with sorrow surging round. On Jesus' bosom, naught but calm is found. 
Peace, perfect peace, that suffering sharpest throws. The sympathy of Jesus grieves repose. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away. Jesus keeping your safe and they. Peace, perfect peace, our future all unknown. Jesus we know. He's on the throne. Peace, perfect peace, death shadowing us and ours. Jesus has vanquished them and all his powers. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will be with you. Amen.